Hello and welcome back to CS631 Advanced Programming in the Unix Environment. This is week 5, segment 7, and yes, we are still talking about the different Unix tools that make up the integrated development environment we take for granted. This time we'll take a look at the Make Utility, a tool used to selectively build a code project based on an understanding of the dependency relationship between different source and object files. As we will see, Make is thus more than just a convenient way of saving ourselves some typing when we invoke the compiler. Here, let's start by illustrating why we might even want a tool like this to begin with. Ok, so here's our software project, consisting of several source files, as well as a few header files. We might compile our program like this. Ok, that worked just fine. But now let's say we want to edit the file compare.c. We make a simple change here, enabling silly sort. Now when we recompile the project, we are again running the same command. But note that in this case we again compiled all the source files, even though we only made one change in the file cmp.c. Now let's consider a more efficient way of building our project. Instead of always compiling all source files, we run cc-c against each individual file. Remember from our previous videos in this series that if we pass dash c to the compiler, we will create object files only and then use a separate stage to link the files together. So now we have these various .o files here, and we can link them into an executable like this. Ok, so far so good. Now let's again edit the file cmp.c. comment out silly sort, but now instead of compiling all files, we we'll just compile the file cmp.c, then link the object files. Ok, so this is a bit more efficient. The overall difference as shown here is relatively small, but imagine you have a complex software project with hundreds or thousands of source files. Not having to recompile all of them is going to really save you some time here. Now let's consider what happens when we make a change to a different file. Let's say that we edit statflags.h and change the default mode down here. Now what files do we have to recompile? Well, let's see which files include this header file. There, main.c and statflags.c. Each file that includes this header file might now have changed, so we need to recompile both main.c and statflags.c, and then again link the .o files. In other words, I need to keep track of which files have changed and which files might be affected by that change. Our software project can then be represented as a dependency graph, like this. Here we see an illustration of these dependencies. We can tell that a change to cmp.c requires us to rebuild cmp.o and then ls. And a change to statflags.h means that now the files main.c and statflags.c must be considered outdated, which means that we need to rebuild them and create the main.o and statflags.o object files, and then recreate the executable by linking the updated .o files on the right together with the .o files on the left, which have not changed since our code change. Maintaining such a map of dependencies in your head is not going to be a scalable solution. So enter make. Make is used to maintain these dependencies. It reads a definition from a make file and determines so-called targets as being derived or built from certain sources.
The way make then builds these targets is by executing specified shell commands. So make allows us to specify the commands we want to execute to build a given executable from the specified source files. So let's create one of these make files. By convention, we use a target called all, and then provide the command we want to execute, cc, c flags, star.c, dash o, ls. Now I can type make, and there we go, it builds our executable. And if I were to make a change to, say, cmp.c, then all I need to do is type make again, and it'll build ls. But while this saved us some typing, this didn't really solve the dependency problem, now did it? We are still recompiling all code files. In fact, even if nothing has changed and I type make again, it will again recompile all files. So let's see if we can improve on this. For starters, we can change the target name. After all, we want to build the ls executable, so let's call our target ls. This is the effect that now if we run make, it tells us that hey, this executable already exists and must be up to date, no need to recompile all the code, so that's an improvement. But if we make a change to one of the source files, and here we just fake this by touching the file, thereby updating the last modified timestamp of the file, so it looks like it has been changed. So if we update this file and run make again, well, no good. So we need to improve our make file. Here, let's do this. We grab the source files, and now edit our make file. We tell make that ls depends on these .o files. If these .o files exist, then we link them in this first step. Next, we further tell make how to create the cmp.o file. cmp.o depends on cmp.c, meaning whenever the m time of cmp.c is newer than the m time of cmp.o, we run this command here. Now we repeat the same instruction for the other .o files. and change the names, and now make knows that to build ls, it needs to build cmp.o, which depends on cmp.c, and for which it runs cc, cflex c, cmp.c, and so on for the other object files too. So let's see what that looks like. Okay, we run make, and compiles each object file and then links them. If we now touch cmp.c, make is smart enough to only recompile that one file. And if we run make again, it knows it's got nothing to do. Neat. But our make file still feels rather clumsy. Here, look at all this repetition that we have here. Let's be smarter. Let's create a better make file. To do that, we will use a so-called suffix rule, as well as some variables to show you what make can do. Like in the shell, we can assign values to variables, which, like in the shell, are written in uppercase by convention. So here we define a program variable to be ls. We can then define the list of object files we need as the variable obj's. And we can define our preferred c flags here. Now with these variables in place, let's get rid of all this stuff here and create a suffix rule. 
A suffix rule is a rule that tells make how to build a file ending in one suffix from a file ending in a different suffix. So here we create a rule that tells make how to build a .o file from a .c file. We do that by running cc cflags-c. Because we now have a generic suffix rule, we can't just put the file name here, but make knows about a few special variables. So here, $less means then the initial suffix name, .c in our case, and $at means the target suffix name, .o in our case. So this block then covers all the individual definitions we had here before. Now we add our all target, which we simply set to proc. When you run make, the command will automatically look for the first target definition, so using all really is just a convention. But we still want to use the program name, so we could also run make ls, for example. Here we define the rules for proc. Proc depends on the object files we had defined above, and which will then be created automatically via the suffix rule. Now, as we read in the manual page, make simply executes shell commands, so that we can put anything in here, including diagnostic messages. By default, make will print out the command it executes. By prefixing this statement with an at, we suppress this. So this statement here simply lets make tell us the dependencies that it considers. The actual building of the executable then is done, as before, via cc. Another thing that we are used to is the clean target that allows us to easily remove any intermediate object files so that we can then recreate the executable from scratch. So let's add that target here too. Okay, now let's see what happens when we run make. Here we go. We see that make builds each object file using the suffix rule we had specified. Note also that while our environment variable c flags is set to dash wall dash w error dash w extra, make used the definition we had provided in the make file itself. If we run make again, nothing happens because our target is up to date. If we change cmp.c, then make will selectively rebuild only that file, then recreate the executable. Likewise, if we update main.o, then make will only run through the linking stage. Make clean removes our object files and make rebuilds our executable. As we just saw, we can have make use variables that we defined in the make file, which then override any environment variable we may have set. But what if we want to use a different value from the one set in the make file? We could edit the file, but there's another possibility. By specifying the variable declaration on the command line, we can overwrite that value too. Now, make used dash w error in favor of both our initial environment variable as well as the hard coded value. Next, note that up here we used the ldflex variable, but that variable wasn't set at all. Likewise, we used the cc variable, but that too wasn't set. We don't have set cc in the environment either, and still make called the compiler correctly. 
That is, make has a few built-in variables that it defaults to. For the cc variable, that is the cc command. ld flex, however, is not defined at all, so remains empty unless we explicitly set it. All right. So we've seen how make sorts out the dependencies that the menu is specified in the make file, which is really quite useful. So when the .c file changes, it will selectively rebuild the corresponding .o file and rebuild the executable. But what happens when we change one of the header files? Hmm. Nothing. Well, that's not surprising. We didn't tell make about the dependency relationship between this header file and the .c file that included. We know that if this header changes, then these two .c files need to be rebuilt. So we can add that to the make file. Here, main.o now depends on statflags.h. And statflags.o also depends on statflags.h. Cool. Now make again does the right thing. But that means that we have to tell make again everything manually ourselves. For the .c files to get the .o files, the suffix rule is obvious. Just change the suffix. But for a .h file, there is no one-to-one -one relationship. So wouldn't it be neat if we could automatically generate the dependencies? Enter makedep, a tool to do just that. It goes through the given C files and generates dependency rules that make understands. So let's grab the example given here. And add it to our make file. So now we have a new target, depend. When we run make depend, make invokes make dep, which produces a file called dot depend. Here, this is what it looks like. Oh wow, look at that. It determined exactly which header files each .c file needs, including those pulled in by the other header files. So if any one of these files were to change, we'd have to rebuild this file. Now make still knows all the rules from before. Our suffix rules tells us how to build the .o from the .c file. But now, if we change the .h file, make will know that it has to rebuild these two files here. Neat, huh? Oh, and one last trick. See our .c.o suffix rule here? Let's delete it. And look at that, make still does the right thing. That's because, just like make has internal definitions for some variables, such as cc, it also knows about a few suffix rules. Building c project is something that make was developed for, so this rule to run cc c flags dash c for each .c file is something it has built in. Okay, let's take a break and recap. All of these examples given here should be enough to give you an idea of what make can do. And of course there are example make files included in the code samples on the course website, so make sure to play around with those on your own. As we've seen, make is really just a command generator. Well, not just, but at its core, it really only runs the commands you tell it to run by writing a description into makefile. But it's a bit more than that. It is able to sort out which commands to execute in which order based on the relationship of the files, which then allows you to avoid having to rebuild the entire project, to recompile every single source file when you only made a change to one or two files. That is, 
Make performs selective rebuilds based on the internal dependency graph it determines based on your description as well as the last modified timestamp of the files in question. We've seen that we can simplify general logic using a number of rules and variables or macros, and that make has some of these built in. And while the examples we covered here are relatively simple, I hope that you can see that there is significant power in this tool. In fact, make is really quite complex and has, not surprisingly, been implemented multiple times by the different Unix versions. And each version has extended the tool a bit and changed a few things here and there, so that now we have at least two primary flavors of make, BSD make and GNU make. These two differ quite a bit in how they assign and expand variables, how they allow for the inclusion of other files, and how you can build flow control into the make file language itself. All of that should hopefully whet your appetite to not only use make for your assignments in this class, but to learn a bit more and maybe seek a good online tutorial. Having a powerful build tool like Make at your fingertips is just one of the many great things about Unix as an integrated development environment. And yes, we still have a few more tools to cover in our next videos, so stay tuned, and until the next time, thanks for watching. Cheers.